We are so excited to announce that the Remedial Herstory Project will be having our first annual summer retreat coming to you in August of 2021. Join us here in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Kick back, relax, enjoy the spa and a little bit of women's history. We are so excited to be bringing some of the best women's historians in the world to you. They are here to teach you the bits of women's history that you may have missed in history class, and we are here to guide you on the tools that you will need to get them into the classroom. The retreat is 50% pedagogy and 50% women's history. You will leave with dozens of printed lesson plans, learning materials, and tools that you can use. You can see the entire schedule of events on our website, as well as the names of some of the historians who will be presenting www.remedialherstory.com. Look for the page about the summer retreat. Come relax and enjoy the White Mountains of New Hampshire with us. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today? Oh, wait. I'll tell everyone what's happening in today's episode. Ooh, I'm so (laughs) excited. Tell me what's happening in today's episode. So I got a chance to talk to Judy Battalion. No way. I'm so stoked. She wrote a book recently, right? She did. And she's a pretty incredible woman. So I can't wait to tell you about her. Oh my God. I can't wait. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Unknown resistance fighters. Ooh, Brooke, I'm so excited. I am too. This was a really fun opportunity um, that I got to talk with her about her book, her upcoming book that's coming out, um, which is really, really incredible. And it's about World War II heroes, but really these untold stories of Jewish fighters. Um that were teenage girls yeah. in, in the ghettos. and Working so, to liberate their own yeah, people. Yeah. yeah, and really incredible story. And so let me tell you a little bit about Judy. And I, she actually uh, let her introduce herself, and then we can talk a little bit more about her. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. I'm Judy Battalion. I'm a writer and author, um, also with a background in history. I have a degree, undergraduate degree in the history of science and an MA and PhD in the history of art. And I spent many years working as a researcher for museums. Um, I also spent years working as a comedian and writing, uh, I, I used to be funny, writing um, uh, performance pieces. I did a number of things for stage. And and then I started writing for magazines and freelancing for a number of years for newspapers and magazines and blogs. And I wrote a memoir. Uh, and here we are with my new book, The Light of Days. It, it, in many ways, many of these come together in this book because it is a history book. It is a nonfiction and narrative nonfiction book that um, it, you know every sentence is researched. You could probably tell by the nearly seventy pages of footnotes. But it's also told through story and through narratives. Um, and I worked really with many, many testimonials and memoirs and first person accounts. And so I sort of wore my hat as a memoirist and a narrative writer and as a historian and a historical researcher. So both of those came together in this book. So, yeah. So she's pretty incredible. Yeah. A comedian? Like what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so she's just got this amazing history. Some of the things that she didn't cover is just, um, this really cool, you know, backstory of, of her family, but, um, but also why she started to get into this, I think is really interesting. And so I'll actually let her tell you a little bit about how she found these stories initially Hmm. and why she wanted to start writing about this. Okay, cool. I should probably tell you about how I came to this story at all, um, Mm -hmm. which was completely by accident. Um, uh, I was living in London 14 years ago and, um, I I was at the time I was interested in my Jewish identity. I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And I, I wanted to write about what I thought of as the emotional legacy of the Holocaust, the way that trauma passes over generations. In, In my own life, I was thinking a lot about danger 
and how my Holocaust heritage sort of shaped the way that I perceived and reacted to danger in my everyday life. And I wanted to write about that. I wanted to write about Jewish women who had confronted danger. And one example popped into my head, and that was the example of Hannah Senesh. And she's someone I had studied in fifth grade. And Hannah Senesh, for, for those who don't know, was a um, she was a Hungarian Jew. She was young, around 20 years old. She moved to what was in Palestine before World War II. But during the war, she decided to fight. She joined the Allied forces. She became a paratrooper and she volunteered to go back to Nazi occupied Europe and fight the Nazis. I'd always grown up with Hannah Senesh as a symbol of courage. She was a hero, but she was a symbol. And I think back in 2007, when this began, I was actually interested in learning about Hannes, not Hannes Senesh the hero, but Hannes Senesh the person. Who does that? Who chooses to go back and fight the Nazis? I wanted to understand her psychology. I wanted to, I, I was looking for a more nuanced biography of Hannes Senesh, something that explored her personality, her, her, I mean, boldness rather than just a sort of hero narrative. This led me to the British Library, where I looked up Hannah Senesh and ordered, there weren't very many books, so I ordered whatever they had. And one of those books ended up being quite unusual. It was like an old book, dusty, with a blue fabric cover and gold lettering, and was also in Yiddish. It was called Freuen in die Ghettos, Women in the Ghettos. Um, but even more unusual than the book is the fact that I speak Yiddish. So I start flipping through this book, which intrigued me as an object, really. Um, and I was looking for Hannah Sedish, but she wasn't in it. Flipping, flipping, flipping. She's only in the last few pages. In front of her, there was about 150, 160 pages of stories of other young Jewish women who had fought the Nazis and who had fought from inside the ghettos. Um, pictures, bios, snippets of obituaries and testimonies. And uh, I, I was stunned. The chapter titles were things like partisan combat, um, women in battle, ammunition, weapons. This was both in tone and in content so different from any Holocaust narrative I, I'd ever come across. Um, I, I immediately, I knew there was something remarkable about this. And, and since that day, on and off, but since that day, I've been, I've been working on this project. When you started to think about all of these women and writing down this story and, and telling more about this experience, why did you choose this type of format? You mean a narrative nonfiction book? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't immediately choose this format. Um, originally. I originally got a grant to translate that Yiddish book. And that's what took me the first few years of working on this was me translating. It was almost a, a scrapbook. I only found out later it was excerpts of other newspaper clippings and obituary books and some testimonies that had been exerted and translated into Yiddish for an American audience in 1946. So this book had no context. It didn't, it didn't explain who these people were, what they were doing. So it took me a long time to translate. And originally I was going to publish it as a translation, but it was, it was almost too obscure. It's too difficult for a contemporary audience to really understand. Understand. So then I was going to work with a scholar in the field, and we were going to publish it as a uh, annotated translation, with the idea it would be a resource for other researchers and other Holocaust scholars. But a little part of me always felt like I thought more people would be interested in it than just scholars of the of the Holocaust, and um, and because I started writing it as a novel. You didn't realize this answer was going to be 20 minutes here. So I then started writing it as a novel and as fiction. And I, I took the character, Renya, who ended up seeing my central character. And, but I combined her with my grandmother. And I, I sort of created a, a fictional character. And, and then it was really in 2017 when the women's marches began that it, it like hit me. Like, wait a minute. I have a really good story here about women's resistance, about organized women's resistance. 
And also at that time, there were a few books starting to come out about hidden women's histories and that were, that were doing very well. Like clearly there was a hunger for that kind of story. So I, I mentioned this all to my agent just in passing. We were actually meeting about something else. This is my literary agent. And she stopped me and was like, what? This is true? Jewish women were hiding guns under their clothes and, and shooting Nazis? And, and I said, yeah, this is what I found in this book. And she was like, Judy, 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 this is a very, you, you have to tell this as a true story. This is, it's very important to tell it. This is, you're writing it as nonfiction. Um, so then I went and for six months worked on something completely different because I still couldn't, I still couldn't commit. I, I, I knew how hard this was going to be, even though I'd already been working on it for years. Um, and, and then finally, one day I just sat down and I wrote a book proposal. I mean, in like a few hours. And that was basically the beginning of this project. And, and then and then I was in. Then I was all in. And then for several years, this was a more than full-time uh, uh, research and writing project. Pretty interesting how she came up with this idea and how she fell across this book, which yeah. is so random. But there are stories that it's shocking we don't know about. Yeah, I think it's a really, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now among social historians to try to make sure that you're not telling, you know, especially when it comes to Holocaust history, yeah. to there are Jewish people that are working to uplift and to save and to do whatever they can in whatever their capacity is, wherever they are in the world. And um, especially in a U.S. history class, and you're actually catching me, I just went to the, the local World War II Museum oh, today. Cool. And it was interesting walking around with my colleague who teaches in the humanities across the hall, and he's looking around, he's like, this is the most like <laughs> patriotic place I have been in a long time. And I think there's a tendency in history classes to show the U.S. as these liberators. And, right, yeah. And that is true in, in some senses, but it it um, definitely takes away from the work that people are doing in, inside. Yeah, and the local heroes. The local heroes who are really facing danger every single day. Yeah, and so this story that she is capturing, you know, there's very little written um, in the in academics in the English language about these figures, and so she's telling this really this narrative about um, the main character in this book, and I'm going to pronounce the name wrong potentially, but it's Rina Kokilka, and she is she began the resistance when she was 15 years old. So she's 15 years old. Yeah. She's young and she's a fighter, but she's what they would consider as passing Yeah, as Christian. So because mm. of the way that she presents and the way that she looks, she's mm. got lighter skin, lighter eyes, lighter hair. And so she doesn't um, present as Jewish mm. or what they deemed Jewish. And, yeah. And in that based on Nazi propaganda. Exactly. Yeah. And so she's able to sneak past guards and get through um, different areas much easier than a lot of the other girls. Mm. And she watches, you know, her entire family be taken away. Yeah. Um, and she wasn't. And so mm. this is how she kind of starts to build the resistance. But I want to let Judy tell a little bit about some of the really incredible things that she went through and overcame. Mm. Um, and these are just a hint of what is in this book. Okay. So pretty interesting. Yeah. So the central character is a woman named Renya Kukielka. It's funny. She was always the central character. And I think partly it's because in that original Yiddish book, there was an XR excerpt from a memoir that she wrote and published in 1945. And it was the longest piece in that Yiddish book. But it was also the most memorable to me because it was narrative. And she wrote in a, in a detailed way about her experience running missions for the underground that the material was so shocking. It was so full of movement and, and life. She, she's someone, she jumps off trains. You know, this was, it was so different tonally from, from what I was used to reading about the Holocaust. And 
it really struck me. She, she's even witty at parts. Um, I, I felt, I, I really felt the person beneath the writing and, and I felt like it was a good story. And I had only seen an excerpt of it. That was before I knew she'd written a whole book with many more details and adventures. Um, and I, I was also drawn to her because she was not, many of the women I write about were very political. They were part of these socialist uh, um, youth movements. And they, they, they wrote with strong, some of them, they're, they're different branches of socialism, but they wrote with a strong political motivations, but she didn't. She, she wasn't particularly political. And it, it, to me, that made the writing more relatable and it felt more contemporary. Um, and, and, and so she, that's how she kind of took her place at the center of the story. She was 15 when the war started. She, she had finished school at 14. Um, and she became a stenographer. She started working in the town's court. Um, but then it was 1939. She was defiant from the start in the ghettos. She would would slip out of the ghetto and trade um, family goods, heirlooms for food. Um, she was always trying to help refugees coming into the ghetto, trying to gather information. Her, her family realized they were going to be killed and she escaped. She fled the ghetto by herself. Um, she ran through fields. She, uh, Again, she she pretended to be Christian. She had a what they called a good look. She could pass for being a Christian girl, which is a big part of this story. Um, and she she was recognized once on a train. She got up with her suitcase, walked to the end of the train, and just jumped off. Um, she was a quick witted, daring person. And she got a job working as a housekeeper in a half German family, but she really wanted to be with her sister. And she ended up finding ways to make contact with her sister and her sister smuggled her over to this town of Beijing, where her sister was based and her sister was part of the underground there. And when she got there, the underground needed a girl who looked good, as they called it. She was 18 at this time. Um, to do missions for them, to run missions to Warsaw. And they asked her if she would go. And she said, of course, I'll go. Um, she was filled with fury. She found out her parents had been killed. Her siblings had been killed. She was wanted vengeance. She wanted justice. And she wanted to fight. And... Uh, so she ended up doing missions in 1943 between Bajin and Warsaw, slipping out of the ghetto, again, pretending to be Christian, walking through fields, getting on trains, using all kinds of fake papers, working with various smugglers, bribing Nazi guards with whiskey. Um, and she went to Warsaw. She would gather information and give information she transported money, many fake IDs, uh, fake Aryan papers. She also met with weapons dealers in the Warsaw Cemetery, bought guns from them, strapped them to her torso, um, hid explosives in her bags, and would go back and forth on the train, you know, sometimes pretending she had confessing to having a few potatoes that she wasn't supposed to have to kind of distract them at the, at the checks and checkpoints. Um, she, she also helped rescue a few people. She accompanied them out of the ghetto and helped find hiding spots for them in Warsaw. Um, and then eventually she was caught and she was taken for being a Polish underground operative, a Catholic, um, resistance fighter, even a, a caught, they did not know she was Jewish. And she was imprisoned in, in very brutal Gestapo political prisons and still, still pretending, still performing the whole time. Um, and she eventually masterminded her way out. I can't tell you everything. No, please buy the book. <laughs> but I gave you a lot. 
The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the K-12 curriculum. Our goal is to create free learning materials for educators to use tomorrow. Head over to our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Download everything and give it to a friend. We need women's history in the classroom like yesterday. If you're not a history teacher and you want to do something to help us out, head over to our store. We've got all sorts of fun things for you to peruse and all of that goes to supporting our mission. If you think what we're doing is needed, you can support the Remedial History Project by becoming a sponsor through Anchor or becoming a patron. Patrons get access to behind the scenes materials, gear, bonus episodes, and more. Most importantly, they're putting their money where their mouth is and helping us get women's history into the classroom. Our herstory maker, Jeffrey. Our herstory heroes, Christian, Brooke, and Barbara. Our herstorians, Jamie, Kent, Jenna, and Nancy. And our herstory allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah, Anne, and Alicia. Thank you so much. You all make this show possible. How much do you know about the women who have dedicated their energy to making the West a richer, more diverse and equitable place? Women like Norma Carr, a leader in women's athletics during the implementation of Title IX. Before Title IX, women and girls had no rights to play sports. Tune in to This Is Her Place, a podcast about Utah women past and present. We share the stories of many kinds of women, from politicians like State Representative Karen Kwan. If we were to ratify the ERA, we send this grand message of hope. To educators like Lily Eskelson Garcia, the former president of the National Education Association. I closed the book and did the eyes on the prize as my textbook. And they said, didn't you get into trouble? Gold medal winning athletes like WNBA player Natalie Williams. You know, when they say you're in the zone, (laughs) I was in the zone that game. And entrepreneurs like Lucy Cardenas, owner of the world-famous Red Iguana Restaurant. The biggest, the main ingredient is love, how much love you put into it. I'm Naomi Watkins. I'm an educator, author, and a transplant to Utah by way of California. And I'm Mike Aguilar. I'm a marketer, storyteller, community volunteer, and the proud son of a remarkable Utah woman. We may focus on Utah women, but their stories are universal to the varied experiences of women in the West. Listen to This Is Her Place wherever you listen to podcasts. See you soon. Pretty interesting stuff. I mean, obviously, there's so many really cool things. But I think the really cool part for me, not being a historian or not being, you know, a history teacher, I sit there and I I really enjoyed the book and the fact that there were so many pictures, Mm. (laughs) (laughs) which sounds like a little kid, but there were so many real photos in the book that she – um, paired with all of these stories. So I didn't have to imagine what these girls would have looked like in this time period. I could see, yeah, you know, if they're smuggling guns in bread across multiple lines, you know, and they're doing this and the risk they were taking and, and how risky they were being at 15 years old. Yeah. I love stories of young people in history because mm. you can tell them and look out at your students and for the students, it resonates with them. Big you time. Know, it's like, oh, that could be me. And what? whoa, that person was doing that at, and dealing with those things at my age, right? Yeah, exactly. It puts a lot in perspective of the time and the pressure that they mm-hmm. felt to take action, um, which was just so incredible. And that's part of it too, is that these are girls that are in – in Poland and they're the resistance for their local community. And they're kind of the last standing resistance before the entire town is really taken. It's, it's a very interesting mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the last things I wanted you to hear is a little bit of a personal piece to why Judy felt like writing this story. Mm-hmm. And um, I think as a descendant of someone who is a Holocaust survivor, mm-hmm. it is very imperative that, these stories are told. And yeah. so I think she had a very specific calling, but I wanted to share. She shared a really amazing story of her grandparents um, mm. that I think not necessarily is about history, but it's about a person that lived and I mm-hmm. think it's of value. So. Oh my gosh. I I mean, anytime you can get a person who lived the history that you teach in class, like those personal stories make it real for students. Yeah. And it obviously resonated with you. So I'm really excited to hear 
her family story. Yeah. So this became a, a big question for me. And I felt like the sub question of all my research on the one hand, what happened? What was the story of Jewish women in the underground? And on the other hand, what happened to the story? Why didn't I know? Why didn't I know this from a Holocaust survivor family and community? And I, I'd done so much work in women's studies and I, it didn't make sense. Um, and there are many reasons. And again, I get into it in the book and I, I, I can't give it all away. Um, but some of these reasons are, you know, there, there, first of all, there's been very little written about Jewish resistance at all. And what has been written has been by and large written by men about men. Um, but more than that, I think that there are more complicated and nuanced reasons around this having to do with politics. There are certain ways in which the Holocaust narrative has been shaped for political reasons, and that differs in different countries. It, it differs in Israel and in Poland, especially. Um, there's also questions or issues around the zeitgeist. I think we're interested in different elements of the Holocaust at different times. We're also uncomfortable talking about different elements of the Holocaust at different times in, in the past decades. So for instance, in, in the 60s, people talked a lot about Auschwitz or the concentration camps. And in the 70s, they were more bohemian time the idea of physical resistance or violent resistance was downplayed. Um, and there was more of a talk on spiritual resilience and nonviolent resistance. I think a lot of it is has to do with personal reasons. Um, many of these women just didn't tell their story or they did tell their story at first, but they weren't believed. They were accused of collaborating. There was kind of this, I heard this over and over, this idea that the innocent souls perished, but it, those who survived the Holocaust must have done something to survive. So they slept their way to safety or they were collaborators in some way. Um, many of the women felt a tremendous survivor's guilt. They felt that compared to their fellow survivors who had been through Auschwitz, they hadn't had it that bad. You know, who were, they felt almost like they didn't merit telling their story. They didn't deserve it because they hadn't suffered as much as others. And then, and then some of it, and I think this is the case for Renya, if I'm not giving away too much, is that there, there was a need to move on. The, these women were very young in the war and when the war was over, they had their whole lives ahead of them with no family, no home, no nationality. They were refugees in new countries and they needed to recreate their lives. And, and for some of them, they told, like Randy had told their story right away. And then that was part of almost the therapy and put it behind them in order to create lives for themselves, to, to have children, to have families, to raise them in a more happy, normal context. Um, and, and it took until more recently till many of these women realized they, they were not going to live forever. And if they were going to tell their stories, they had to tell them. And, and, and many times it was grandchildren who um, asked their grandmothers about their stories. There was a different relationship between the grandchildren. Grandchildren like my generation felt more pride in their grandparents. It wasn't as fraught a relationship. So all these factors led to more of these stories coming out only more recently. My grandmother was older than these women. She was born about 10 years before, five, 10 years before them. So she was about 30 when the war started. She was married. So her and my grandfather escaped occupied Warsaw together and they fled east. And I, I actually never got a full understanding of the narrative, just bits and pieces. Um, there was a convent, there was a fruit truck, they, a Nazi who turned a blind eye, they were swimming across a river. I, I, I know my, they met up with my grandfather's brother and there was some shootout in the town and my grandfather is very short and the bullet grazed his neck and shot his brother in the heart. And his brother died in front of him. And my grandfather had that scar his whole life. He would sometimes show me the, the scar on his neck. Um, they, they fled east to over the Russian border. And like many Jews who fled east, they were 
uh, forced into work camps in Siberia. And that is how they survived the war. They never talked about those work camps. In, in fact, it's a, another, here's another book, a really underreported um, story. The majority of Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust survived in this way. And yet it's very uh, under discussed. Um, and then my, my mother was born in 1945 on, on their way back to Poland, where they lived for a number of years, trying to figure out if anyone in their family was alive. Pretty incredible. Yeah, that's um, amazing. It is. And it, I had an opportunity in my sixth grade history class, we covered the Holocaust. And um, I had an incredible, incredible female history teacher in sixth grade. And she um, really brought the Holocaust to life. We did, we cross pollinated it with our English class, our science class, mm. talked about um, different chemical warfare during, mm -hmm. during the Holocaust. So we got deep yeah. into this topic, but we had two Holocaust survivors come and speak at our school and there's mm. not many left, which I yeah. think is really interesting. And so our children will not have that opportunity because there's not many, but the Holocaust Museum it's supposed to be one of the most incredible places. Have you it been is. there? So many times, I can't count. <laughs> but um, yeah, the Holocaust Museum in DC is unbelievable. And there's some around the world too, um, but th it's unbelievable. And w I was actually just thinking about it the other day because I teach a little bit about the Holocaust in my psychology class as well. Um, and in in the museum, what, you know, obviously it's, it's, so rich with mm. historical documents and artifacts and you know they have actual train cars that like transported people to camps wow. um but they do a really good job making you feel i am feel as you're walking through and i've never walked through the museum without crying at least once and i definitely have to i mean i've probably been 10 times and every time i have to like focus on a different corner or a different thing There's so because much. you can't take it all in in one in yeah. one trip um otherwise it would have to be your day <laughs> yeah really um and and even then i don't know if you could emotionally process the the whole space um there you know you were talking before about not many survivors of the holocaust of world war ii broadly um you know, being around anymore. And, um, first of all, there are, there are people that are around, um, fewer that are willing to talk, um, even sure. so many years afterwards, I've interviewed many, um, World War II veterans and that seems to be a theme. One interesting thing is that I'm able to interview their wives and their wives have lots of stories to tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, when, when they don't have the, the mental strength or fortitude to talk about what they witnessed and observed, yeah. their wives sometimes can. But what's really neat is the National World War II Museum, uh, which is down in um, New Orleans. They've actually done a lot of recordings of interviews with people from the, the generation. Very cool. So like literally pick a topic in World War II. There is an interview available online that you could like oh, show wow. your students. And it's really, really neat. Um, I found some like a, a Japanese um, American man who served in the U.S. Army after – um, per, the attack on Pearl Harbor and what it was like to know that like his family is being interned back home and he's like serving for the U S that's um, incredible. Yeah. Just really, you know, different. And for women's history, like wax and waves, like all of those women have their stories have been recorded and saved there. So there are really neat personal experiences that that teachers could draw on and use in their class. I love that. There I love those because it brings it to life. It brings it really close to this actually happened because I think when we think about World War II, it feels very distant mm. to our generation and then I can't imagine how distant it feels to your students. So yeah. I love that that you can bring all of that in together. Yeah. That's awesome. I think it's so important that we're getting these stories told and that they're out there, but it's great that we're getting new versions of them too, like Judy's. And so yeah. I was so grateful to have some time to speak with her about her journey in writing this book, which was a long one. 
but I'm so excited that it's out in the world and that people can get it. So it is, it's called The Light of Days. It has been optioned by Steven Spielberg to become a movie, which would be awesome. really, really awesome to see these women. Um, but something that Judy did mention is that these are incredible women's stories, but these are by no means the only, um, female Jewish resistors in Poland or in Europe during this mm-hmm. time. So these are like a snapshot of what she was able to capture and tell. Um, but there's so much more out there and, and more to tell. And she's very much looking forward to telling future stories, which um, I think we all be looking forward to. So you can get that on Amazon and other major book retailers if you want to purchase her book. But oh my God, it was very fun. Awesome. Brooke, thank you so much for meeting with her, yeah. sharing her story, and telling me a little bit about it today. Of course. Well, enjoy. Um, I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.